Our, our text for this evening is Job chapter 3, but I really want to begin by going back a little bit into Job chapter 2, because at the end of last week's study, I don't feel that I really gave the treatment that it deserved to really consider uh, this whole phenomenon of Job's friends coming to him. I, I mean, if I could just sort of briefly recap, in Job chapters 1 and chapters 2, we have this remarkable story of a very godly, blessed man. He's blessed materially. He's blessed in his family. He's blessed in his character because he's a very righteous man. Uh, just a really an amazing man on the earth in those days uh, who was a, a sincere um, lover of God and an obeyer of God. He was just simply a godly man. And then we, we see the heavenly scene sort of behind the curtain where there's this whole drama going on, a contest, a, a, a wager, if you will, between God and Satan as to the real motivations for this man, Job is his name, his service of God and his obedience to God. And basically what it is is that Satan says that Job serves God for no real purpose other than the blessings that God gives him. And if the blessings were taken away, then Job could be very easily induced to curse God instead of bless him the way that he does. And so God allows Satan to take away all the blessings that Job has, and Job very steadfastly does not curse God. Well, then we, we are taken up to the heavenly scene again, and we see God and Satan sort of having another contest, another wager over this man Job and the circumstances of his life. And Satan insists that if he's given the permission to afflict Job in his body physically, then Job can be induced to curse God. And so God gives him the permission to do yet this. And this horrible physical affliction comes upon Job. Horrible. It doesn't kill him. D death would be preferred, as we're going to see in chapter 3 tonight. But rather, he suffers in just intense physical pain. And even gets to the point where his own wife, discouraged and devastated by the losses in her life. Well, let's not forget, she lost all her wealth as well, right? She lost her ten children, much more important than the wealth, obviously. But in the midst of all of that, this poor woman curses God and tells Job that he should do the same. And then Job sits down on this ash heap, this burned out place, perhaps the garbage dump of the town. He takes a broken piece of pottery. He scrapes off the painful boils that are torturing his skin, probably just some effort to, you know, scratch the itch that, that bothers him so much. And then we see something wonderful, really, at the end of chapter 2, verse, verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuahite, and Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him for they saw that his grief was very great. Now, one of the reasons why I think it's important that we go back over this from last week is because the next many weeks that we're together in this study through Job, we're going to be talking about what these three friends had to say to Job. And we're going to have a lot that is critical to say about what these three friends said to Job. The, these three friends had their shining moment here in chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, where they didn't say anything, where, where they were just with Job, empathizing with him. And you have to admit, it's a powerful and a beautiful picture. You can just see it in your mind's eye, can't you? You can see these three men, just the, the, the tears streaming down their face, sitting with Job, just broken with this man who's utterly broken, weeping with him. And you have to be struck by the power of that phrase. What is it, verse 13? So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. They just sat there sharing in his grief. It was a wonderful display of comfort and common cause with Job. You know how the New Testament says that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and we should do what? We should mourn with those who mourn. And that's exactly what these men did. 
They, they offered no statement except for their own compassionate presence. And again, I want to make this very clear because after this point, the book of Job begins 35 chapters of discussion between Job and his friends. But, but all of that discussion has to be put in the context of the genuine love and concern that these three friends had for Job. Listen, listen as you get later on in the book, these guys don't like each other at all. They're arguing back and forth. They're accusing one another of terrible things back and forth. It gets kind of ugly later on in the book. But don't forget the beautiful way how it began. I would suggest to you that there is a sense in which these friends earned the right to speak their mind to Job, and they earned it through their loving compassion of sitting with him through seven days and seven nights of silence. Now, it is true that Job suffered greatly at the hands of these men later. Yet, we got to give, give them some recognition. They really do deserve some recognition. They're, they're to be admired because they came to Job. They're to be admired because they wept for Job and they wept with Job. They're to be admired because they sat in silence with him for seven days. They're to be admired because they intended all along the best for Job. I want you to remember that. Later on, when we get into these friends and, and, and their messed up ideas in trying to minister to Job, their intentions were good. They really did want sincerely, deeply the best for Job. And they're to be admired because they spoke their opinion about Job and his condition. They spoke their opinion to Job himself. They didn't talk about Job behind his back. They said it man to man, face to face to him. Because I'll give you sort of the story in a nutshell. These men think that all these problems have come upon Job because of his great sin. And they're going to persuade him to repent. They're going to fail in that effort because Job will hold on to his integrity. And this is one of the important dynamics in the story as it'll go on through the following chapters. You see, they, they believed that Job was suffering because of some severe sins that he had committed. And they felt they had to try to persuade Job to repent of those sins. I like what one commentator named Bradley said about this. He said, we leave Job and his friends seated in silence. There is a calm around them, but we feel that the air is heavy and that there is a tempest in the sky. We shall hear the storm burst and the thunder roll when next we meet. Well, you don't have to wait long for the thunder. It starts right here in chapter three. Look at it here, chapter three, verses one and two. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, pause right there. You see, after this, this was after all the catastrophe, after all the personal affliction, after all the demonstration of compassion from Job's friends. Now Job will begin to speak about his situation. And what did he do? The first thing he did says he cursed the day of his birth. If you want to give a theme for this chapter, I don't know what your Bible says. I don't know, maybe some of the chapters in your Bibles are giving headings or themes or something like that. This is Job curses the day of his birth. That's what all chapter three is about. And this is what he did. As he cursed the day of his birth, we remember that Satan was very confident that he could push Job to curse God. Do you remember that in Job chapters 1 and 2? But as Job spoke in his deep distress, he did powerfully, eloquently, passionately curse the day of his birth, but he didn't come close to cursing God. It's interesting as you study sort of relevant ancient writings, sort of somewhat similar to the book of Job, you'll, you'll see that Job's thinking was somewhat common among ancient peoples. The, the ancient historian Herodotus described an ancient people who mourned new births. When a new baby was born, they mourned. They put on, you know, black and they, they acted as somebody died because they said, listen, we recognize the suffering that this new life is going to have to endure. And matter of fact, these same ancient peoples, they rejoiced in deaths. They figured, hey, this is a final release from the sufferings of this life. But what I really want you to understand as we jump into verse 3 in just a moment here, as we hear from Job's lips the agonized cry of his soul, 
please understand that this chapter begins the battle in Job's mind and soul. We've already seen the battle that happened in Job's outward circumstances, right? That was very plain. That was very evident. Job is not going to lose more than he's already lost at this point in the story, right? He's not going to lose more wealth. He's not going to get afflicted worse physically. He's not going to lose more children. His wife's not going to die. You know, other than he's not going to endure more circumstantial affliction than what he already has. He's not going to lose more, although he's not going to suffer more, although we got to say his physical pain endures through this period. But yet at the same time, we say that at this time, Job's battle enters into an entirely different arena. Now the battle's fought in the arena of Job's mind and Job's soul. How will Job choose to think about his suffering? That's the battle right now. How will he choose to think about what others think about his suffering? How will he choose to think about what God is doing in the midst of all this? These are the questions that take up the remainder of the book. And very soon, these questions come to anybody who's suffering, right? You know, let, let's say um, somebody's involved in a tragic automobile accident, right? They're driving around, something terrible happens to the car, they're injured, they're laid in the hospital. Now, listen. There's a sense in which as soon as they're laying in the hospital, their trial is over, right? The, the, the car's not going to roll over again. They, 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 they've received whatever blows, whatever injuries, whatever difficulty is going to happen to their body. It's already happened, right? But you know very well that when they're laying in the hospital, that's when the trial begins, right? When they start asking, well, how do I make sense of this? How am I supposed to understand what is happening? How am I supposed to understand what other people think of this? How am I supposed to understand where God is in all of this? This is the new battleground for Job in the midst of all of his sufferings. You see, the catastrophic loss itself is only an entry point into this agonizing battle of the mind and the soul. Now, verse 3. Job, just sort of fasten your seatbelts here. here. Here he goes. May the day perish on which I was born and the night in which it was said, a male child is conceived. May that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. And as for that night, may the darkness seize it. May not re- may it not rejoice among the days of the year. May it not come into the number of the months. Oh, that it, that night may be barren. May no joyful shout come into it. May those who curse it curse the day, those who are ready to arouse Leviathan. May the stars of its morning be dark. May it look for light but have none and not see the dawning of the day because it did not shut up the doors of my mother's womb nor hide sorrow from my eyes. So here, in very fine Hebrew poetic style, Job curses the day of his birth. Yet yet if that were not enough, he goes back even further and curses the night of his conception. Job's complaint is that it would have been better if he were never born than to have to endure his present catastrophe of affliction. Now, this whole section begins a long period of chapters in the book of Job with somewhat like a dialogue between Job's and his friends. And sometimes a speaker in this dialogue is going to answer what the previous speaker said. We'll see this next week when we get to the reply that one of the friends gives to what Job says here in chapter 3. But but sometimes when one of his friends is speaking or when Job's speaking, they're not really answering the person that spoke before them. They're just pouring out their heart or their mind on something else. Sometimes the speeches are very emotional. Sometimes the speeches are very logical. Sometimes when Job speaks, he's speaking to his friends. Sometimes when Job speaks, he's speaking to God. Sometimes he's just speaking to the air. It's kind of interesting. Job's friends speak a lot about God, 
but they never speak to him in all of their speeches. But Job, he talks to God a lot. And again, I want to emphasize to you, that beginning with Job chapter 3, verse 3, the verse that we just started with there, may the day perish on which I was born. Here, the style of speaking and writing is poetic. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. When we say that the style of speaking and writing is poetic, we mean that we allow for exaggeration and figures of speech. Now listen, we all believe that we're to take the Bible literally. Well, maybe I shouldn't put that upon you. I'll say that that I believe that very strongly, that I am to understand the Bible literally. And when you say that in front of cultured people, oftentimes they're horrified. Oh, good heavens, you take the Bible literally? You know, as if you must be some, you know, intellectual monster or something to be so foolish as to take the Bible literally. But I would suggest to you there's absolutely no other way to understand the Bible other than literally. But when I say that, when I say understanding the Bible literally, we say understanding it according to its literary context. This is what I mean by that. When the Bible speaks as a historical record, it's a true historical record. When it speaks as poetry, it's true poetry. But we don't expect you know, the same sort of uh, precision and description and poetry as we do in historical, uh, you know, narrative. And so it's up to us to be able to look at the passage of Scripture and be able to say, what kind of literature is this? What is the literary context? And when somebody is speaking in a poetic style, we understand that and we give them, if you want to say, we give them the the right, the, the reason to use more exaggeration, to use more poetic figures of speech. You, you probably heard me quote this before because it's one of my favorite examples of it. I can't quote you the chapter and verse. I should have it in my mind, but I don't. It's one of the passages in the Psalms where David says, that I cried so much that I made my bed swim with tears. Now, did David actually mean that he cried so many tears in his bedroom that he flooded the room with the water from his tears and his bed was floating upon the tears? You and I read that, well, no, that's not what he meant. But then could you see where somebody said, well, then you don't take the Bible literally. Well, no, we do take it literally. And when David said, I flooded my bed with tears. We understand exactly what he meant, right? There was a great big wet spot from tears on his bed from all the tears he had been crying, right? We understand it perfectly. Well, in the same way, when we take a look at what Job says, we we just have to understand it as poetry. So for example, you're going to hear, and this isn't tonight, but later on, you're going to hear Job, he's going to call God his enemy. He's going to say some very tough things to God and about God. And we have to be able to put it all in context. So let's go back what he says, right? Verse 3, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. May that day be darkness. Here Job is despising the day of his birth and wishing that that day could be wiped off the calendar of history. I want you to notice Job does not curse God. He doesn't curse God here. He doesn't curse God anywhere in the book of Job. But here he makes one of his strongest statements against God and especially against the wisdom and the plan of God. It's as if he's saying, you know, God, the day I was born, that was a bad day. That was a bad plan, God. You shouldn't have done that. It's very interesting in sort of the phrasing that he uses. If you take a look again in verse 4, may that day be darkness. It's almost as if he's thinking back to those original words that the Lord spoke that are recorded in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. It's almost as if he's using the same terminology saying, no, let there be darkness. Let there be darkness on the day that I was born. Now, it's a logical absurdity, right? You can't create darkness in this way. But Job isn't speaking logically. He's speaking poetically, and we catch his idea completely. He says, cursed be that day. And then he says later on, what does he go on here in verse 4? May God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. 
May darkness and the shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, may darkness seize it. Let it not be included among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Oh, may that night be barren. Let no joyful shout come of it. May those who curse it, who curse the day. Now again, did you notice here, and I'm just sort of speaking stylistically, verses 4, 5, and 6. Do you notice how Job is essentially repeating the same idea with different words? It's very powerful, and it's very characteristic of Hebrew poetry. But there, as we saw in verse 8, he says, May those curse it who curse the day. Job isn't endorsing the ancient practices of sorcery, but he's call upon those people who make curses. He listen, if there's anybody out there who does curses, why don't you throw a curse on that day that I was born? It's as if he summons these ancient soothsayers and witch doctors to come and curse his birthday. Now, I don't think Job is endorsing them or, or personally believing in their power, but he's just saying, listen, if any day should or could be cursed, it should be that day that I was born. And then in verses 8 and 9, he says something very interesting. Did you notice that? Did did a little question come into your mind when we read verse 8 previously? Let's look at it again. May those curse it who curse the day, those who are ready to arouse Leviathan. And you read that and you go, Leviathan who? What's that? What's Leviathan? Now this is the first mention of, of this strange creature in the Bible. But Leviathan is mentioned very prominently in a long discourse beginning at Job chapter 41, verse 1. Usually, Leviathan is considered to be a mythical sea monster or dragon that terrorized sailors and fishermen. Now, in the present context, the the, the idea may be that that Job, um, or or, excuse me, is even as sailors or fishermen would curse Leviathan and not want him to, to, you know, bother them. So Job may also be saying, listen, I, I want just as much as they would curse Leviathan, I am cursing the day of my birth. It's very interesting. Because you get into this whole idea biblically, and we'll talk about this more later on in the book of Job. When you're talking about Leviathan, it's interesting to talk about, is this a real creature that is described? Now, some people think, no, Job is just borrowing a figure from, you know, the mythologies around him and just sort of weaving it into his story, just using it as a picture. You know, just as much as we might say, well, a dragon did this or, or you know, um, he was as brave as a dragon slayer or something like that. Now, you're not trying to say, well, I literally believe that there's dragons and we can scientifically have proof of these things. You're just sort of borrowing a picture that everybody understands and you're using that to make your point. But there are some people who believe that there's much more than this to this idea of Leviathan. The name Leviathan means twisting one. And he's also referred to in several other interesting places in the scriptures. Psalm 74 verses 12 through 14 refer to Leviathan as a sea serpent. And it says that God broke the head of Leviathan a long time ago, perhaps at the creation. Psalm 104 verse 26 also refers to Leviathan as being a sea creature. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 1 speaks of the future defeat of Leviathan and also associating it with the twisting serpent that lives in the sea. Then Isaiah 51 verse 9 and Psalm 89 verses 8 through 10 also speak of a serpent associated with the sea that God defeated as a demonstration of his great strength. Now, the name Leviathan isn't specifically used in Isaiah 51 and Psalm 89, but identifies this sea creature, this sea dragon, if you want to call it that, with the name Rahab, which means proud one. And then finally, you could say in Job chapter 26, verses 12 through 13, it refers to God's piercing defeat of a fleeing serpent that's associated with the sea. You see, it's kind of interesting. 
you go back to some ancient rabbinical legends. Ancient rabbinical legends or mythologies suggest that an evil serpent was in the primeval sea resisting creation and that God killed the serpent and brought order to the world. Now, there are some people who think that this primeval serpent was Satan resisting God's power and that these are just sort of hints or clues to it scattered throughout the Bible. I do find it interesting that Satan is often represented as a dragon or a serpent. Genesis chapter 3, of course, as a serpent. But in Revelation chapters 12 and 13, Satan is presented as a dragon. And the sea is also thought of as a dangerous or threatening place in the Jewish mind. Therefore, Leviathan may be another serpent-like manifestation of Satan, who was the original Rahab, or proud one. That's what the, the serpent is called in another place. And so I, I sort of put before you two alternative theories that later on in the book of Job will touch on again. Either Leviathan is a deeply significant meaning to a manifestation of Satan that has a connection to God's work on the earth before the creation of the world and then all the way into the end times connecting with Revelation 12 and 13 and Job is hinting at it here or it doesn't really mean anything and it's just sort of a little reference to a, a contemporary mythology that Job is making. I see more meaning into it than that. I, I sort of buy into this idea that Leviathan has sort of a shadowy, cloudy, but yet deeply significant meaning. I do find it interesting that the Puritan commentator, John Trapp, he avoided the discussion of Leviathan altogether. He said, I don't want to talk about this one bit. And if I started talking to you about all the different interpretations of what Leviathan is and what his significant is, he says, listen, I think Job is more tormented with the expositions that go on over Leviathan than he ever was with all the physical things that came upon him. Well, I don't know if I could say that, but at least it was the opinion of John Trapp, this, this old commentator. In any regard, you get the idea here of this first section all the way through verse 10 where Job laments the day of his birth. You, you can feel the agony of his soul. Well, let me tell you, he's just getting started. Look here now at verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breasts that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest with the kings and the counselors of the earth who built ruins for themselves or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver? Or why was I not hidden like a stillborn child, like infants who never saw the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and the weary are at rest. Their prisoners rest together. They do not hear the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Job continues on here, starting at verse 11 his great complaint speaking from his place of misery. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Now again, using poetic exaggeration, Job powerfully communicates his present pain and his feeling that it would have been much better if he would have never survived in order to face such catastrophe. And again, looking on it from the outside, we can completely identify with Job's feeling here, right? Here's a man who lost everything in one afternoon. And then on another afternoon, this incredible physical burden in the form of suffering and disease and pain was put upon him. And he's just saying, you know what? I don't need this. It would have been better if I would have never been born. It's as if Job would have said this. He said, listen, I have asked that the day of my birth be obliterated. And that didn't happen. It has not happened and it cannot happen. So why could not I have been born a stillbirth, right? If I had to be born, then why couldn't I died right when I was born? Now listen, we look at Job here, and it's easy for us to kind of detach ourselves from Job and to say, hmm, my Job, you're, 
you're being quite emotional right here, right? And he is, isn't he? But it's easy, although it's very, very wrong, to think that to think that Job was in some kind of sin because he was so emotional. We should remind ourselves that the Bible never presents to us this stoic, unfeeling. How else could you describe it? You know, the, the British call it the stiff upper lip, right? Where you just, you know, things don't bother you. And it doesn't matter if the world's falling apart. Well, just uh, pip, pip, cheerio. You know, everything's fine. Everything will be all right. Or, or you could think, if you want to think of more popular culture, you know, you think of that old uh, series Star Trek on television, right? And you always had Dr. Spock, right? And his whole thing was Mr. Unemotional. Nothing bothered him, right? Never a smile, never a frown, just this completely level personality. Some people think that that's some kind of a Christian ideal. And I think it's flat out wrong. Listen, it can't be emphasized too strongly that the very, and, and you would call them startling statements that Job makes in this chapter. It, it doesn't mean that Job has gone crazy under the strain. There is no hint here that Satan is going, yes, yippee, he's cursing the day of his birth, I've won. No, Satan hasn't won, and Job hasn't lost. God is testing Job, but but he's not testing Job to see if he's as, as unfeeling as a piece of wood. He's not testing Job to see if he has the, the emotions of a statue. He's testing Job to see if his faith is going to hang in there through this trial. And if it means that Job lets loose, and issues this primal rant of, of, of pain and agony, well, then so be it. And listen, it is a rant. Listen, he says here, he says in verse 13, for now I would have lain still and been quiet. I, I would have been asleep. You know, only if I would have died, oh, that would have been quiet. You know, he goes into a, you know, a, a funeral home, you know, when there's the body and the casket and there's everybody. It, people are generally pretty quiet at those things, right? Not a lot of, you know, loud talking and celebration. Not like a birthday party. It's like a funeral, right? So, oh, it's so quiet there in the grave. Now, we're, we're sort of confronted with something at verse 13. Let me read it again. Job is thinking about what it would have been like if he would have died just after birth. And he said, for now, I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. I'm just going to be flat straight with you here. I hope this doesn't upset anybody, but I need to be very honest with you. Job was wrong. Job was wrong in his understanding of the afterlife. Perhaps at this point, Job believed in something similar to the modern doctrine of soul sleep, which is a wrong doctrine. But what it says is it says that the dead lie in the grave in some sort of suspended animation, some sort of suspended state until they're resurrected on the final day. Job doesn't have a clear consistent understanding of the afterlife. It's very interesting because sometimes Job will give you some of the most outstanding statements in the entire Old Testament about confidence of resurrection. I know that my Redeemer lives and I will see him with my own eyes and I will stand with him on that day and we're cheering, yes, yes, Job, you, you have it all understood so clear. And then we read this in chapter 3, verse 13 and he goes, listen, when I die, I'm just asleep and it's all quiet there in the grave. And we look at this and we have to say that the Old Testament doesn't have a particularly clear understanding of the afterlife. It's very interesting that people who teach this idea of soul sleep teach it based on Old Testament texts. They don't teach it based on the New Testament. And the idea of soul sleep is wrong because of what the Apostle Paul clearly wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul understood that if he was not on alive on earth, he would be in the presence of God and not in some suspended state lying in a grave. Paul also understood, and he explains this in Philippians chapter 1, that if he died, it would be an immediate gain. Now, if I died and my body just went into the grave and just 
was stayed there in the grave and I had no existence until the resurrection happened at some later time, it would not be an immediate gain for me to die. It'd be better for me to live as long as I could on this earth, right? Well, Paul understood that his death would be an immediate gain. Now we look at Job here, and I don't want anybody to criticize Job here tonight. Nobody should be thinking, well, Job, you're dumb. You don't know your Bible very well. Now let's understand something. We can explain Job's lack of knowledge in the afterlife by understanding the principle of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. L let me read this verse to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. It says that Jesus Christ brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In other words, life and immortality were not brought to light until the ministry of Jesus Christ. The understanding of immortality was at best cloudy in the Old Testament. It's much clearer in the New Testament, thank God. But for example, we can say that Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about when he described hell and judgment. For example, in Matthew chapter 25. And so we rely on the New Testament for our understanding of the afterlife. We do not rely on the Old Testament. Now, we also understand that this does not take away in any manner, from the truth of the Bible and the truth of the book of Job. But what is true is that Job actually said it. And what is true is that Job actually believed it. The truth of the statement in itself, it has to be evaluated according to what the rest of the Bible says. By the way, later on, in Job chapter 38, in two places, God challenges and corrects Job's presumptuous, idea, presumptuous ideas regarding the afterlife. He says, listen, Job, do you really know what it's like beyond the grave? This is late in the book when God challenges Job. And Job has to admit, uh, gee, I really don't know what it's like after the grave. And God knows and Job didn't. And I have to say another place where Job was wrong here. And again, I... I I'm saying this not to criticize Job. We're, we're being very generous to Job, right? Here's a man who's endured a, a tremendous conflict. But if you look here, starting at verse 13, or excuse me, in verse 17, where he says, There the wicked cease from troubling, and the weary are at rest. You see, Job was wrong in this view of the afterlife. He had the feeling that many people have, that the world beyond is somehow a better place for everyone. In fact, I have to tell you that the wicked do not cease from troubling in the world beyond. Their trouble only increases. The prisoners do not rest in the world beyond. And perhaps the only voice that they hear is the voice of their oppressor. Did you see that in verse 17? There the wicked cease from troubling and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners do not, or the prisoners rest together and they do not hear the voice of the oppressor. You know, that's the sad truth is that that's not the case that there are many people in the afterlife, that that's all they hear. This deception that somehow the afterlife is good for everybody is remarkably widespread. You know, one of the most notable examples I've heard of it in the last 10 years ago involved the, the infamous young men who murdered uh, all these people at an American high school in Colorado, the, the infamous Columbine murderers. Uh, their names were Eric Harris and Dylan Claybolt. And they left behind a videotaped document spelling out the motivation of their crime. You know, they, they said it quite clearly. Here, we're going to go to the high school. We're going to kill all these people who we felt have been bad to us. You know, we're going to go out killing all these people. And then the last segment of that videotape, it was shot the very morning of the murders. Harris and Klebold are dressed and they say that they're ready for our little judgment day. That's in quotes. Then Klebold, he's looking sort of tense, and he looks at the camera. He says goodbye to his parents, and then he concludes with these words. He said, I didn't like life too much. Just know that I'm going to a better place than here. And in a matter of hours, he killed a bunch of people, and then he killed himself. I can tell you with some confidence that that poor young man did not go to a better place. 
he went to a much worse place. And his worst, worst day on earth would be better, infinitely better, than his conceivable best day in hell. And so we understand, when Job speaks here, this is the agonized outpouring of a soul in anguish. We are not expecting theological certainty or explanations of the afterlife from Job. He's pouring out the agony of his soul, as I said before. He just says, listen, I think it might be better to be dead than to be the way I am right now. And we can empathize with him in that, right? Now, verse 20, he's going to continue his lament. Why is light given to him who is in misery? And life to the bitter of soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and search for it more than hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes before I eat, and my groanings pour out like water. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. You know, Job wanted to know, if you go back to verse 20, why is light given to him who is in misery? You know, we we can really empathize with Job's line of thinking. God, I am so miserable. Why do you allow the light of life to continue to be given to me? (laughs) Did you put me on this earth just to be this miserable? Why, God, do you allow those of us in such misery to go on living? And, And why is life given to those of us who are so bitter of soul. Did you see that in verse 20? Why is light given to him who is in ministry? Or mis- ministry? Oh boy, there's a Freudian slip. I didn't mean that at all. Why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter of soul? You, you, you see, it, it's very a moving, poetic expression of an idea expressed in the previous passage. He's again speculating on the idea Listen, oh, death must be better than the condition I'm in. You see, Job talks here in verse 21 about those who long for death, but it does not come. Of course, this gives us something significant to raise with Job. In no place whatsoever does Job seem to contemplate suicide. There's a big difference between saying Oh, I'd be better off dead. I wish I were dead. Why do I go on living and saying, I'm going to do something to end my life? Job never did anything. We would not regard him as suicidal, even though he longed. He longed for the release of death. I like what Matthew Poole says. He says, it is observable that Job did not lay violent hands upon himself, nor do anything to quicken or obtain his death. Despite all of his miseries and complaints, he was contented to wait all the days of his appointed time until his change came. And that's quoting from Job chapter 14. And then he goes on. And Again, I find Job to be very powerful in these words right here starting at verse 20. Again, why is light given to him who is in misery? and life to the bitter of soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and search for it more than hidden treasures. And then going on to verse 23, why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? Isn't that amazing? And whom God has hedged in. Job's trouble did not come because he had lost faith in God. Job felt, and you could say he even feared, that God had lost faith in him. And he says, listen, why continue living if I can't see the way and if God has trapped me in this place, as if God has hedged me in? just have to say, this is really incredible. 
I remember back to chapter one where Satan complained that he wanted to get at Job, but he could not. Why couldn't he get to Job? Because God had set a hedge all around Job, right? We look at the hedge of Job chapter one, we go, hallelujah for the hedge, right? Woo, boy, the hedge really protects. It keeps Satan away. Isn't that great? And then we look at Job chapter three and we look at this agonized man in the midst of his misery. And he says, Lord, why have you hedged me in? I feel trapped. And you could say that those are two hedges, right? Maybe they're one hedge, right? <laughs> Maybe the outside perimeter of the hedge is the thing that keeps Satan out. But maybe the inside part of the hedge is what makes us feel sometimes like God has trapped us. You ever feel that way? I feel, Lord, you've trapped me. What, what, what are you playing games with me, God? You've trapped me in a specific place. But listen, when God does that, he has a reason to do it. And as we look at this knowing sort of the backstory from Job chapters 1 and 2, we, we could say, well, well listen, Job, there, there's a whole reason for all this. But Job couldn't see it, right? That the man here described can see no reason for the trouble that he's in. Look at verse 23 again. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden? Job says, I'm like a blind man in trying to understand this calamity in my life. I can't comprehend it. God, I, I, my way is hidden, God. Why do you continue to allow me to go on living if you're not going to explain all of this to me? Actually, there's many answers to that question. Can you just see Job crying out to God? God, why do you allow me to go on? Well, God can answer that question. God allowed Job to continue on in life to teach a lesson to angelic beings, right? Wasn't that what he was doing with Job? Job, I'm using you to teach angelic beings a lesson. That's why I want you to continue on in life. God allowed Job to continue on in life to teach him a special reliance upon God. Everything else is going to be stripped away from Job. I mean, can you imagine Job, you know, his seven friends, or excuse me, his three friends are there with him for seven days, not seven friends, three friends for seven days, not saying anything, just sitting silently with him, sharing his suffering with him. And Job's thinking, you know what? I lost everything, but at least I got these guys. At least I got three friends who will stick with me like this. Don't worry, Job. They're going to turn on you too. Everything's taken away from Job. Everything. And God allowed him to go on. God gave him light, so to speak, to teach him a special reliance upon God. God allowed Job to continue on in life to teach him not to regard the wisdom of man so much. You see, his three friends, once they get talking, and we'll see this starting with next week, oh, they've got a lot of wisdom, but it's the wisdom of man. God allowed Job to continue on in life to vindicate him before other men. Can I just remind you that at the end of this story, Job is vindicated. At the end of this story, Job is put in the right and all of his friends are rebuked. Well, that's why God wants you to keep on going, Job, because I want you to vindicate you. God allowed Job to continue on in life to make him an example and a lesson for all ages. And you could say that God allowed Job to continue on in life to give him more than he ever had before. Do you ever think about that? I've probably said this in the first two studies, but it's so important, I think, that it bears repeating. At the beginning of the book of Job, what do you have? You have a good man and a blessed man, right? What do you have at the end of the book of Job? You have a better man and a more blessed man, right? Everything that happens serves to that purpose. And so now Job is crying out of the heavens, why do you allow me to go on? And of the many answers God could give to that, God could say, because I want you to be a better and a more blessed man. Oh, okay, God. I guess it really is for my good. But again, it's hard for Job to grab onto. And we can empathize with him, right? I mean, we look at it right there in verse 3. He says in, verse, excuse me, in chapter 3, verse 24, he says, For my sighing comes before I eat, and my groanings pour out like water. He's just flooding out with emotion. 
And then he says, for the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. Job reminds us that that before this disaster came to his life, he he didn't live what you might call a happy, carefree uh, life. He he was concerned that trouble might come to him and his family. So he took precautions before God to present it. We found that in Job chapter 1 verse 5, where he offered sacrifices on behalf of his children, just in case they might have sinned. But now it's a completely different situation. He says here in verse 26, I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. With these four final blows of the hammer. Can you feel the four final blows? I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Job thinks that death would answer all of those, right? (laughs) If I was dead, I wouldn't have those problems. And that's why death looks like a pretty attractive destiny for Job. You see, throw it all, he shows that a great man of faith can fall into great depression and despair. The great preacher of Victorian England, Charles Spurgeon, he described just this kind of season in his own life. Let me read to you. He says, I was lying upon my couch during this last week and my spirits were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child and yet I didn't know what I wept for. But the very slight thing will move me to tears just now. And a kind friend was telling me of some poor old soul living near who was suffering very great pain and yet she was full of joy and rejoicing. I was so distressed by the hearing of the story and felt so ashamed of myself that I did not know what to do and wondering why I should be in such a state as this while this poor woman who had a terrible cancer and was in the most frightful agony could nevertheless rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Spurs goes, why? Why? Why do I go through this? Why do I have this kind of distress and agony? Yet again, we have to say that as agonized as Job's outpouring was in this chapter, don't you think it's better for him to get it out than it is to keep it in this sort of dark and silent brooding within his soul? You know, I think it's helpful. I think it's good for Job to, to give his rant, to give his cry out like this, to get it out. But I have to say this, what Job has just done is set in motion a firestorm because he started the conversation, right? You had the picture in your mind's eye, right? Job and his three friends sitting around on the ash heap. For a whole week, they just sit there and say nothing. But then Job breaks the silence and now he won't be able to get his friends to shut up. We start on that starting with next week. But I just want you to see that now it's going to be back and forth with Job. That it all began with this agonized outpouring of soul. That that actually, we have great sympathy for Job. I mean, we could look at this and we could say, Oh, Job, where's your faith? Oh, Job, where's your your theological precision, right? You, I, I can find two or three places where your theology isn't correct here, Job. And, and you, you also don't seem to be rejoicing all the time, right? But I think we can't read this and have any other reaction but just to say, Job, we wish we were there. We would just hug you and say we're sorry with you and tell you to be able to trust in God's wisdom and his ability to see you through a difficult time like this. One of the great reasons why Job is such an attractive book is you can't help but read it without seeing some of your own sufferings in it, the sufferings of those that you know and love. To say, Lord, I, I, even if I go through the same agony that Job went through, I want to come out at the end with the same process as well. Father, that's our prayer through this book of Job, that you would teach us. And we're thanking you tonight for your faithfulness to Job and your faithfulness to each one of us in our own times of suffering and our own times of misery. And Lord, we're not here tonight to put our misery next to Job's in comparison. Lord, I don't think that there's a single person here tonight who could say that they've suffered as bad as Job. Perhaps, Lord, all of us put together haven't suffered as bad as Job had. But Lord, our sufferings are nevertheless our sufferings. 
We lay them down before your throne and we ask for you to be something great through them. And especially, Lord, help us to trust Job, to trust you in a way that Job had trouble doing. We have so much more revelation, Lord. We have so much more wisdom from your spirit and from your word. Help us to take full advantage of that and find full comfort in you. Even, Lord, dare I say, to be able to rejoice even in the midst of a difficult time. But more especially, Lord, to mourn with those who do mourn. Help us to do it, Lord, and to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.